So we have just finished a two-week overview of marriage in this, uh, so we're calling it topical summer, this series of thinking through relationships. So for the bulk of our church calendar, we work through books of the Bible. Here in several weeks, we're going to begin walking through the book of Judges to return to the Old Testament. And so uh, before we do that, though, we're, we're taking some time to say, how can we think about having and fostering healthy relationships here within the church? We've thought about friendship. We've thought about marriage for the last few weeks. And this morning, we're thinking about singleness. In our marriage sermons, we considered what it is and what it does. Marriage is a covenant relationship that reflects and refers to the gospel. Marriage is for the kingdom of God. It's for spiritual friendship and it's for transformation as we journey with our closest spiritual friend to the kingdom of God. I hope you married folks found those sermons helpful. I hope it served as a sort of teaser for the conversations we have in premarital and marital counseling. The best time for like pastoral marital counseling is before you really need it. So consider this an invite to think about these things together over dinner and in the study. Of course, not everyone is married. Not everyone will be married. But everyone at some point in their life was is or will be single. To singleness we turn this morning. Now I confess this can be a perilous topic because it represents such a different experience for so many people. Some of you want to be single, some of you do not. Some of you enjoy singleness, some of you do not. Some of you really want to be married, some of you do not. Some of you feel really included in the lives of your married friends, some of you do not. For some of you it's a sensitive topic. For others, it's not. Some of you may find a sermon on the topic maybe a little bit cringy, a little unnecessary, or perhaps well-intended theologizing that is just detached from lived experience. Others, however, would be curious in what the scriptures say, not seeking to avoid the topic, but to lean in and learn from the word of God. And I think just as we have sought to seek a biblical understanding of marriage, we should seek a biblical understanding of singleness. On a fundamental level, these sermons have more in common than you may think, because neither your marriage nor your singleness determines your existence. Jesus does. Just as marriage is aimed at the kingdom of God, so too is singleness. Just as friendship is central in marriage, so too is friendship central in singleness. And just as God transforms us through a lifetime of marriage, God transforms us through a lifetime of singleness. The Christian tradition that so dignifies marriage is a Christian tradition that so dignifies singleness. This morning I want to consider singleness from 1 Corinthians 7. At at this point in Paul's letter, he's addressing a series of issues the church at Corinth has raised in a letter that they sent to him. Of course, this is a letter we do not have, but it's a letter we have Paul's response to. In this section, he talks about marriage, divorce, one station in life, and eventually he'll talk a little bit about whether it's appropriate to eat food sacrificed to idols. And here, in this response from the apostle to the church at Corinth, we find some helpful, sustained reflections on singleness that will be especially helpful for our single brothers and sisters, but I think helpful for those of you who are married as well. This morning, from 1 Corinthians 7, I want to consider singleness as gift Singleness as assignment, and singleness for devotion. Singleness as gift, singleness as assignment, and singleness for devotion. The title of this morning's sermon is On Singleness. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, let's just look at verses 6 and 7. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God one of one kind and one of another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holly's mom's side of the family. Holly's in preschool and her mom's not here, so we're just going to talk a little bit. Holly's mom's side of the family uh, has a white elephant gift exchange every year at Christmas. I think it's kind of a new thing. I don't think they did it like before me much, but it's been a thing since I've been there. And if you've ever been to something like this, a few gifts usually work their way to the top. 
the top tier gifts. They're the most coveted gifts. Cash, gift cards, things like that. So I drew a number that was towards the end of the exchange. So I had the option to steal from some poor family member or open a new gift. You know, there were some decent options on the table. There were some Starbucks gift cards floating around. There were some Chick-fil-A gift cards floating around. But like, let's be honest, I'm going there with or without the gift cards. So, you know, I'm thinking, I'm just going to kind of survey my options. What if something better is in one of these boxes that are still under the tree? I opt to open a new gift. I'm not particularly risk averse. I get the wrapping off. I open the box and I find an assortment of batteries. Now, I, uh, I, I, you know, I think being a pastor has taught you, like, you really need to be careful how you interact with people in every instance of your life because no matter where you go, you're always the pastor. And I didn't want to be rude to the person who brought batteries, but I was disappointed. And I was trying to kind of keep my disappointment inside of me. The rest of the room was less concerned with a pastoral approach to this gift. So they were very, you got batteries? Oh, you don't want batteries, you don't want batteries. And so I'm kind of disappointed that I got batteries. Fast forward to last week, seven months later, I'm laying on the couch, Roku remote's not working. You know where this is going. I get up and walk to that one drawer that has pens, scissors, receipts, birth certificates, and all sorts of things. And I pull out batteries. Now, normally if I need batteries, I have to go to CVS, I have to go to Kroger, I have to find the batteries. But for the first time in my adult life, I got up from the couch, I walked to the drawer with everything in it, and I pulled out batteries. I got a gift I didn't really want at the time, but it helped me seven months later when that Starbucks someone else had was long forgotten. When some of you hear this language of singleness as a gift, you may feel something like I felt when I opened a box of batteries on Christmas. Maybe disappointed, maybe slightly insulted even. But the Apostle Paul simply did not see singleness this way. In fact, if you were to read the whole of chapter 7, which I certainly recommend you do, you see the way he stresses the benefits of his lifestyle for the kingdom of God. He says in verses 6 and 7, as a concession, not a command. So this is, this is important. The apostle's not saying, I'm not speaking in this sort of normal apostolic function where this carries with it the authority of God. I'm giving a concession. He's like almost speaking personally here. As a concession, not as a command. I say, I wish all of you were like me. I wish all of you were, were single and had a similar station in life as I had. He comes back to that idea in verse 28. It's just bubbling up in him. Those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that, the apostle says. He introduces this conversation by saying, this is not a command, this is a concession. I wish all of y'all were like me. And then he keeps talking, and then he gets to 28, and he's thinking, got to be thinking about all these people in Corinth with all these relationship problems. And he just comes back to that. I just wish you guys were like me, because so many of your troubles are distracting you from the Lord. But what Paul is establishing here in verses 6 and 7 is the fact that everyone has their own gift from God. I think he's broadly speaking about one station in life. When I say one station, I just mean wherever you may find yourself at a given moment in space and time. Your life situation is a gift from God. That sounds simple, but it's countercultural and it's profound. In some ways, it even challenges our church culture a bit. Because what Paul is saying is that singleness is not a problem to overcome. He's saying singleness is not a curse. Singleness may feel like a burden for some of you, and marriage may be a desire, which is fine and good. It's a, uh, a normal and good desire. But the scriptures, the apostle here does not present singleness as a curse, as a problem, or as a defect. He says it is a gift. In fact, putting together what we know about Paul from the beginning of the chapter and later, we could say it's a gift that Paul wishes a lot more people had. Each has his own gift from God, of one kind or another. 
And so here's one of the tasks for all of us. In the battlefield of our mind, fight to see this station in your life as a gift from God. In the battlefield of your mind, fight to see this station, whatever this station is for you. Maybe it's one where everything is great. Maybe it's one where everything is rough. Maybe it's one where you're filled with peace. Maybe it's one where you're filled with anxiety. Maybe it's one where you're filled with hope. Maybe it's one where you're filled with despair and existential dread. In the battlefield of your mind, friend, fight to see your station in life as a gift of God, even if right now that gift feels like a box of batteries. Because that gift is given you for a reason. Singleness is a gift, and singleness is a sort of assignment or vocation. It has a purpose. Let's look in verses 17 through 20. Paul goes on, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. I can't like that for just a moment. Paul says, here's my rule in all the churches. Just live your life. Be faithful to live your life. That's my rule. Notice he has this language of, here's a concession for you. Like, if you want this, if you want to be married, be married. If you want to be single, be single, whatever. But wherever you are, it's a gift. In fact, I wish you were all like me, Paul says. But just live the life that God has assigned to you. This is my rule, not my concession, but this is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Well, then let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Well, let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Verse 20, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. God has given all sorts of gifts. Every gift is unique. He has placed people and called people to himself from all sorts of life situations. Let each person, Paul says, live the life in the situations God has called them by keeping the commands of God. This is really important, brothers and sisters. It's not about circumcised people being uncircumcised. It's not about uncircumcised people saying, oh no, I, I have to go get circumcised. It's not about single people deciding they have to go get married. It's not about married people saying, oh, I heard that Paul thinks we should be single. I gotta be single, sorry, bye, right? It's not about lower class people moving up the social ladder. He'll say elsewhere in this epistle. This is key. The Christian life is less about exterior conformity and more about internal obedience. The Christian life is less about exterior conformity and more about interior obedience. So this is what it means. Paul is less concerned with you looking a certain way, and he's more concerned with you obeying God in the everyday stuff of your life. God meets us where we are and he calls us to obey him right there. Becoming a Christian always requires obedience. It does not necessarily require you to get out of whatever season of life you may be in. Like the Christian faith is not always about God just pulling you out of something as, long, as much as it's about learning to obey God in the middle of something. If you are single, then God's will for your life is not necessarily, despite the pressure you may feel from some, to immediately figure out a way to get married. Live the life God has assigned to you and to which he's called you. Singleness here in every station of life in some sense, but we're focusing on singleness this morning. Singleness is a gift, but it's also an assignment. Live the life God has called and assigned to you. For some of you, that looks like living the married life well. It means taking seriously. Scripture's wisdom for marriage that we considered last week and will continue to consider just through normal rhythms of church life. For some of you, that means looking like what it, learning what it looks like, rather, to date well, to pursue marriage well. For others of you, that means learning what it looks like to live the single life, pursuing relationships or not, doing it well with a heart of obedience to Jesus. Of course, this doesn't mean don't seek marriage. Paul's not saying you must change your life station. 
Your priorities, however, must be aligned to the will of Jesus. Zoom out for just a moment. Singleness is a gift that God has given some. Singleness is an assignment, a vocation that God has given some. But that vocation has a goal, it has an end. Like, it's not just for me and my career and my pursuits, and we'll consider that in just a moment. In the scriptures, we're able to stop seeing singleness as a curse and start seeing it as a gift. We're able to stop seeing it as a, a waiting room and start seeing it as an assignment, a vocation, a way to seek and serve Jesus uniquely. Now to the content of that assignment, we now turn. Singleness, just like marriage, and just like every other station in life, is for devotion to Jesus. Singleness is for devotion to Jesus. Look with me in verses 29 through 35. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. That's a verse you don't want to take out of context, by the way. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. This is strong language from the Apostle Paul. For the present form of this world is passing away. That short, simple sentence is the heart of this portion of the passage. If you're a Bible underliner, I would certainly underline that sentence. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, again, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. That is the other most important part of this passage. I'm telling you these things not to lay on you another burden. I'm saying these things not to put you in chains. I'm saying these things so that you may live faithfully, may live in good order, and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Notice Paul makes clear that he is not here binding the conscience. His counsel is simply counsel that is taking into account a correct eternal perspective on life and all that entails. You know, pastorally, I think sometimes eternity, the reality of eternity, of a life that goes long, 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 long beyond this one, is, is often the elephant in the room that we don't talk about because it feels, uh, it can feel otherworldly, uh, it can feel unhelpful, or it can feel impractical. But, but perhaps the most practical piece of advice Paul has for us is to think about your singleness and think about your marriage in light of eternity. For the present form of this world, Paul says, is passing away. This fundamentally shapes the counsel he gives to married people, and it fundamentally shapes the counsel he gives to single people. The present form of this world is passing away. Singleness is not forever. It will either end in marriage, death, or the Lord's return. But not only singleness will end. In fact, the whole present order of the world will end, Paul says. Here seems to be the overarching charge of the apostle. Focus not on that which will fade away. Focus on that which matters eternally. Give your life to that which will matter 10 billion years from now. This is the great paradox of marriage. This is the great paradox of friendship. Friendship is not about friendship. It's about something else. It's two people saying shoulder to shoulder saying, you love that too. You're going there too. Let's go there together. Marriage is about the kingdom of God becoming the horizon for our souls, and together we journey as spiritual friends to the kingdom of God. Marriage is not about marriage. 
It's about the kingdom of God. Don't seek marriage for marriage sake. Seek marriage for the kingdom of God's sake. In the same sense, the principle of singleness stands. Don't seek singleness for singleness sake. Seek singleness for Jesus' sake. What is your singleness for? Paul answers that question here. It's for good order and devotion to the Lord. It's for good order and devotion to the Lord. Oh, I think this is why Paul is such an advocate for singleness in the Corinthian church. He looks out and he sees so many people who are absolutely obsessed with themselves and their relationships. He sees so many people in the Corinthian church dealing with so many things and he sees God so low on their priority lists. He sees the things of earth, even some good things, are, are crowding out the things of God. This is not just a first century Corinthian temptation, brother and sister. This remains a temptation in the 21st century here in the United States of America. I think this is a massive temptation in our day to allow good things of the earth to crowd out the eternal things of God. Paul says, I, I'm not trying to restrain you. I'm not trying to burden you. The things I say, I say to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. I think the NIV actually translates this a little more clearly. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Marriage is not for comfort, just for your own affirmation, like it's for the kingdom. In the same way, singleness, like marriage, is not for comfort. Singleness is not even for ourselves. The apostle wants you to be unencumbered, not so you can do whatever you want, but so you are free to focus on the things of the Lord. Not so you can set your own calendar, but so when God sets your calendar, you don't have to work at anyone else's calendar. Singleness, contrary to our popular culture idea, is not primarily for career advancement. Perhaps it's helpful to be single while you're away, while you're working on a project, what have you. But singleness purely for work is not the ideal Paul has in mind. Paul's not like, I can make so many more tents because I'm single. Perhaps Paul can make more tents. He was a tent maker bivocationally. Perhaps he can make more tents because he's single. But his goal is not to make more tents, to maximize his tent revenue because his perspective is not on having a lot of money in his bank account. His perspective is on depositing into his heavenly bank account. His perspective is on planting the gospel and growing churches and equipping leaders and spreading the gospel all over the known world. So Paul's not like, oh, I'm single. Look how much I can put back for myself. Paul is saying, oh, I'm single. Look how much I can give of myself for the kingdom of God. Your singleness is for Devotion to the Lord. And one of the things I loved as I was preparing this sermon is how fundamentally similar our purpose for singleness and our purpose for marriage is. Our purpose doesn't change, man. It's to know Christ and make him known. It's that we would be devoted to Jesus. It's that God would shape us as we journey together towards the kingdom of God. Single brothers and sisters, don't waste these years on yourself. Don't waste these months and years waiting for the next to come, uh, uh, something I frankly struggled with in my single years. Don't solely give them the pursuit of pleasure, success, and prestige. Give these years to Jesus and let him use them however he sees fit. If you are here and you're single, don't wait to serve the church until you're married. Don't wait to start something beautiful for the glory of God until you're married. Live today. Embrace this moment of your life as a God-given gift and a God-given assignment that is aimed at the kingdom of God for a life of good order and devotion to Jesus. Married folks, this charge is for us as well. Don't let God's good gifts distract us from the task he's given us. Let us not lose sight of eternity. Let's spur one another on to love and good deeds. The church needs married people and non-married people in it, serving it, and leading it. 
I thought about a word as we work to a close and worship team, you guys can come on up. I thought about a word for those who are pursuing marriage, um, but I didn't want to lengthen the sermon out, especially with our, our trooper res kids in here this morning. Here's what I'll just say. Go back and listen, this is kind of, kind of a cop out, but go back and listen to the last three sermons and let that begin and ask yourself, how does this affect the way I pursue a spouse? So in other words, don't just, I think you'll find, don't just look for someone you're attracted to who will be easy to marry. You know, don't put that weight on looking for the perfect person, the perfect soulmate. They're, they're not there. They're not there. Set your head and heart on Jesus, okay? Follow him with reckless abandon. And while you're doing that, you accept his permission to look to your left and look to your right and see who else is doing that. Who else is on that path? Because what happens is if you have to pursue something, someone else, to find that relationship, and if you get off that path of pursuing Jesus, you find that person, you're probably not, statistically speaking, going to get back on the path that Jesus has laid out for you. Your singleness is for devotion to the Lord. I want to end this sermon with the lyrics of a hymn that some of you may know. You may not know it was written by a lady named Frances Havergal from Worcestershire, England. She studied Greek and Hebrew. She was fluent in German and French. By early adulthood, she had memorized the Gospels, Paul's epistles, Revelation, the Psalms, and Isaiah. By early adulthood, she had memorized the Gospels, the epistles, Revelation, the Psalms, and Isaiah. Another plug for scripture memorization. We can do that. Our kids can memorize not just verses for their lives, but they can memorize chunks of scripture. I think we need to think long and hard about reintroducing big time scripture memorization, chunks of scripture. His word shall I hide in my heart that I may not sin against the tangent. She was an active supporter of the Church Missionary Society. She led hymns at the YWCA in Liverpool and she was always sharing the good news of Jesus with those around her. She died suddenly on holiday in Wales at age 42. She died the way she lived, a single woman, devoted wholly to Jesus. One of her greatest gifts to the church remains her hymnody, a hymnody that flowed from her unwavering devotion to Jesus. And as I was thinking about this sermon, I was thinking about this hymn, I was listening to this hymn, and I looked it up and it was written by a single woman who was devoted to the Lord. And I think the lyrics of it can shape our pursuit of singleness. And for those who are not single, can shape our pursuit of Jesus in marriage. Take my life and let it be consecrated, O Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise. Let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Oh, swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Oh, every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, and it shall be thy royal throne. Oh, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love. My Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasures store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Ever only all for thee. Let's pray. Father, we join with that prayer we just expressed through that hymn. Take our life and let us be ever, only, all for Thee. Give us, Lord, an eternal perspective. Help us not fixate on the bad gifts and help us not get comfortable in the good gifts, but help us look in all things to the giver of all gifts. 
Help us see our lives right here. Not our future life, not our past life, not our hypothetical lives, but our real lives. The lives we live in these bodies, in this moment, in this place, in this theater, and from wherever we may be watching. Help us live this life ever, only, all for thee. And I pray this church would be a, a place where this gospel of Jesus is preached, that, that married people and single people would be the deepest of friends as we journey together to the kingdom of God, that single people would never feel like a, a marginalized people, they would never feel like a second class people, but they would know their dignity and worth, just like married people, is found in the risen Son of God. Shape us, Lord, and mold us for a life of service in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.